greetings to everyone and welcome to the guest lecture series under the quarantine edition 2020 an initiative by techno anza bjpi this is gargi subant and i am thrilled to be your host for today bjpi was established in the year 1887 and is upholding its proud legacy of over a century filled with brilliance and educational prowess furthermore it has thrived in nurturing the brightest minds of the society Technovanza has always been the prime platform where the flame of expertise has been meritoriously passed on to light more torches. An ardent desire to enlighten young minds and inoculate impeccable qualities within them has been the very objective of the GLS since its inception. Hence, during these difficult and challenging times, we at Technovanza find a strong sense of purpose and a desire to contribute towards an uplifting and exuberant event, the GLS Quarantine Edition. Pioneers of diverse fields have graced Technovanza with their presence, while progressively eliminating young minds to new areas of interest. Behold, because today we are elated to add a truly inspirational name to our glorious list of dignitaries. Our guest today is an inventor, cinematographer, an Oscar and an Emmy recipient. Today, we are pleased to host the phenomenal Mr. Garrett Brown. Mr. Garrett Brown invented the Oscar-winning st Steadicam stabilizer and used it on nearly 100 movies beginning with Rocky. His Skycam, Mobicam, and Divecam still pursue athletes worldwide and in 2009 chased their inventor into the Sports Broadcasting Hall of Fame. A legend in Hollywood for 40 years, Mr. Brown still lives and works in Philadelphia and is a 2013 inductee into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. Mr. Brown was recipient of an Emmy Award from the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences for his invention of the Steadicam. So, this small introduction wouldn't do enough justice to you. You have blended the eloquent qualities of hard work and persistence with absolute sublimity, which can never be unseen. We are truly honored by your presence today. We will have a Q&A session after the lecture. So please leave your questions in the live chat below. So we will be sharing with us his expert outlook on the invention of the Steadicam. So without any further ado, let's be a part of a conversation of our shared future under the guidance of clearly the best, Mr. Garrett Brown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gavi. Uh, I'm quite pleased to be here and to speak to you all. Uh, I would like to talk about inventing in particular, because I think that's where the, the great hope of humanity is still more urgently than ever, is to invent our way out of our serious difficulties, which we have caused for the planet Earth and, and for our lives. So. I am a huge fan of invention, and that may be one way, one way that we can that we can help all this. So I will I will tell you the story of my, you know, my first successful invention, which was called the Steadicam. Eventually, uh, I assume that I can share my screen at this point. Am I ready? And lo, here I am. And here we are. My father was an inventor and he gave me his copy of The Boy's Life of Edison. And Edison was our huge inventor in the, in the 19th century in the United States, the light bulb, the record player, blah, blah, blah. I liked the idea of inventing. I, you know, I was a big fan. Uh, my dad actually invented something for the DuPont company, a very important thing, which we all still use. He invented the stuff that binds books together and magazines and allowed them to not crack and fall apart and so on. Except that my dad invented it for a big company and the big company made a billion dollars and my dad got a, a pension and a watch. And that was sort of a lesson to me. And they used to make fun of inventors. 
in the 19th century, in the 20th century. They loved in the news wheels when inventions failed and stopped working, you know, it was not very appealing to me to be an inventor. So I became a singer in the 1960s to my dad's great disgust. However, they, the uh, Beatles came along and it was clear to me that my singing career was not going to be the thing. And I loved movies and I had movie cameras and I started shooting 16 millimeter movies. And I made uh, ways of moving the camera because I loved, immediately loved moving shots. Something amazing happens when you move the camera, not perhaps with this sort of move. This was, this was uh, Napoleon, Abel Gant's amazing film in 1927. And he clearly loved moving the camera. But however, as much as he tried, he could not move the camera smoothly. You can imagine what some of these shots look like. <laughs> and I don't like that. I'll talk about that later. I do not like handheld. This shot must have looked terrible. Well, eventually sound came along and then dollies happened, giant dollies. And that was the way that big sound cameras were moved. But of course they had their own limitations. And so I read all the film books in the Philadelphia library. I taught myself to be a filmmaker in 1965, before some of you were born, I think. And of course, the books in the library are outdated. So I taught myself to be a 1940s filmmaker and I bought a dolly. I bought equipment from a, a bankrupt film producer and I bought this dolly, 400 kilograms. I didn't have this big camera, however, this was my camera, an absurdly pinheaded Bolex on top of my 400 kilogram dolly, because that's what you had to do to make smooth moving shots. It was quite ridiculous, actually. We had five sections of rail because outdoors you had to lay rail, as you saw in that video. And so I had four straight pieces and one curved and all my precious moving shots lasted 24 seconds because that's the nature of the spring wine on the Bolex. I hope you can see my cursor here. And uh, they went straight for a while and curved a bit and went straight for another while. It was really quite absurd. I was probably the person in the United States most motivated to invent something. And what did I invent? I invented a way for the camera to be uncoupled from the ambulatory human being, from the walking human. We're always in motion. The camera has to move smoothly. It was a lovely puzzle to start thinking about. I did have some practice. I invented for a commercial, a way to make a dog point of view by pushing that dog dolly, we called it. It actually was quite smooth because it was stretched out and was held at its center of gravity. I invented a, a way to shoot underneath a helicopter, to shoot at ground level from a helicopter and made a, my little film company made a famous Subaru commercial when the Subaru car first came to the United States. And I actually found the video from this commercial, which you know, even today to my eye is pretty astonishing. This is Subaru circa 1970. That's the view from that ball under the helicopter. And it's remarkably stable. Here come the four new front wheel drive cars from Subaru. And it's amazingly low. Four new cars that give you the convenience and economy you need to handle today's driving. Subaru, four new cars that are beautiful. beautiful. The two door sedan. Oh. The four door, the wagon, and the exciting Subaru GL Coupe, all with front wheel drive, independent suspension, oh, racking and shot. steering. They really handle. They've got the power to cruise at high speed and deliver up to 30 miles per gallon on regular. Subaru, 
the people who knew all about employees, the people who never considered one. Well, for the time, that was amazing. Uh, now we're used to stable shots. We're used to the study cam. We're used to handheld gimbals. We're used to drones. What an amazing phenomenon the drone is. But that shot, you know, presaged the drone by what is it, 50 years? A long time ago. Uh, and what that shot taught me was that a camera on the end of a pole is remarkably stable, particularly if you can stabilize it in two axes. I made this object out of pipe. And by the way, if you want a primitive stable shot, just make a long pole with a T-bar and a couple of weights. These were lead plumbing weights and the camera on the front and just slide your hand along until it balances and then you can run and and make amazing shots with this it it uh it shot stuff i shot stuff that nobody had ever seen before you know moving shots that weren't shaky that you could never do with a dollar In the beginning i went down to canal street new york and i bought aluminum and i made this Camera sits here, your hand holds here, and there's just a couple of weights top and bottom. And it's amazing how well this works. But of course, when you try and tilt up, the lens rises. That annoys me. So I thought, well, maybe I can make it like a, a boom, a, a crane, so that it's a parallelogram. So that started a three months to make this ridiculous object. Lo and behold, it booms up and down and the camera stays parallel, but of course now it won't pan and tilt independently, so. Of course, on a journey like this, you never know where you're going. Uh, you never know if what you have is enough. If you're thinking of inventing, first of all, never give up. Always keep attempting to improve and figure it out. And of course, the primary inventing act is missing, something that's missing. And of course, for the study cam, that something was enormous, and yet nobody was looking for it. And that something was how do you isolate the camera from the, the person, you know? I made a lot of shots with this. I had a fiber optic viewfinder. You can see this clumsy object looking through the lens because of course you can't have your eye on the lens for this particular invention. This is Jonathan W. Brown who is now 50 years old and a film director and these are tests of that parallelogram crane. It was not comfortable to shoot with. That's me with long hair looking very uncomfortable. This is my friend Watts using my invention, which we called, God, we didn't know what to call it, the brown effect level camera holder, the belch. We made jokes about it. But look at the face of the inventor here. This is not a confident look. If this invention had stopped here, it never would have gone anywhere. There would not be workshops. It wouldn't be all over the world. It worked, but it was ridiculous. I did something that is difficult to do at this point. Oh, this is how I suspended it eventually. I had a, a long bungee cord floating it from a hook right here on the handle. So this bungee cord ran back and forth through these pulleys and floated it beside me. And I had a gyro on the back to stabilize it, but uh, it was clear this is not going anywhere. And yet it made amazing shots. This is the steps to the Philadelphia Art Museum. This is the first of two runs that we made down those steps. This is my then girlfriend, now wife, Ellen, running down the steps. And to my surprise, back up again. And it's pretty good. My modern study cam eye looks at it and sees that it's stable as hell, but it rolls. It's rolling. We'll talk about that later. Roll is not, is not good for imitating the marvelously stable way that humans see things. 
So I had very little choice. I had a lot of money in this and it was really, I could realize it was no good. And I did something that is, was tough to do then and almost inconceivable now. And it's something that I would recommend to you, even though you now have a screen and Google and search engines that can find out anything known in the world, I would recommend this plan to you because if you're looking for something that's missing, you will not find it on the screen. I elected to go into a motel notoriously for a week. I turned off the TV. I had room service. I brought great pads of paper and, and pens and, and stuff to make models. And I, I gave myself one week to figure this out or I would give it up. And I found recently all these drawings. This is a crazy one. This apparently is a helmet that goes on your head with springs. <laughs> it might've worked. It, it wouldn't be famous though. This one was a variation on the parallelogram, but it had no film magazine. I forgot the magazine, but I did spend all day and a lot of the night just thinking about this just furiously thinking. And this list, which I made midweek, is actually absolutely on the money. What does this invention need? It needs remote viewfinding, needs to be an equilibrium with a suspension so that you know your moves don't get through to the camera, and particularly so that you're not holding it with your hand because your, your fine motor skills are out the window as soon as you, you know, are loaded that heavily. It needs its weight on your shoulders. It needs to be convenient. Range of lens heights would be great to be knees to head. Knees to above head would even be better. It has to be capable of panning and tilting and focusing and zooming. It has to be comfort, comfortable. Carry all day, I said. It has to be quiet, absolutely must be quiet. And foolproof, that's a tough one and minimum sticking out in space. Uh, this list was amazing, but at that time I did not have the answer to this. I made hundreds of drawings and this finally is the winner. I came out of that, out of that motel with this idea. And this is the form of the present study cam. It has a gimbal, an arm, it has a, this one has a fiber optic viewfinder, but a really good one to allow me to see through the lens. That was tough. That, the fiber bundle was $10,965. And if you accidentally sat on it, it's black. It would go black and you'd have to start over again. But there was no video for, for cameras at the time, for at least video that you could afford to hand hold. You know? This is my patent from 1977. And that patent was never, was never busted, never successfully infringed for its whole life. When it's issued in 77, you get 20 years. So it expired, I think by the time of the last, uh, the last uh, changes to it, it expired in the, in the 90s. And when I looked at that at my young age of whatever I was, 35, I thought, ah, it'll, I'll be 58 when it expires, <laughs> I'll be dead. Guess what? When it expired, I wasn't dead. That was a long time ago. I'm still at it. By the way, an interesting detail, the patent artist appears to copy the look of the inventor. This is the hair from the patent in 1977. Oh, well, an odd, uh, intellectual property detail. And this is the film that I shot in that, in that shot of me running to camera. This is one of the shots in a movie that has become known as 30 Impossible Shots. We just went everywhere with this invention and made shots that were impossible, that could not have been made with the technology of the time. It was easy. I mean, we could just do them one after another. And some of them 
showed me that it was not just a stunt device, that you didn't need to just run all the time. Look at this. That was a really elegant little boom up, dolly around, boom back down again. An inkling of what this thing was good for. My uh, licensee, Cinema Products, I took that Impossible Shots film to Hollywood. I had two offers. I picked a company called Cinema Products. They looked at me and said, okay, kid, go home. We'll take over from here. I think they looked at me as if I was that banjo playing kid in the movie Deliverance. I don't know if you know these films or not, but they looked at me as if I was a savant or as if I had accidentally invented this. And they were professionals. They said, go on home. Seven months later, I was called to come out and try what they had done. And it was grotesque. We made jokes about this, the elephant trunk arm. You can tell by the inventor's look that the inventor is not happy with this. And I insisted that they start over again and that they build the arm the way I built it, not this, but this. And I quickly had a, a commercial to shoot for the great Haskell Wexler. And it was a huge success running with the camera, chasing rock groups, you know? This is Haskell and this is the set of Bound for Glory, my first movie. Haskell immediately hired me to shoot on Bound for Glory. And then I found out to stand on a, on a giant film crane hanging on to be lowered to step off the crane Incidentally, how primitive this was, it was balanced by a roll of tape, tape to the magazine of the camera. <laughs> and here's the video viewfinder, thank God, not the fiber optic, the first video viewfinder, which was a dreadful image, but I had at least a slight idea of what was happening. And I made a three minute shot. I had only two or three takes following this actor, David Carradine, walking through a migrant labor camp during the depression for the movie Bound for Glory, the story of our folk hero musician, Woody Guthrie. Probably a film you don't know in India, but a really interesting one. And this is the first ever study cam shot, walking 100 yards and back. This is the great Hal Ashby, the director, and this is Haskell, and this is my hapless self following Carradine. And this is the result. Lowering on the crane. Stepping off. Staying with him before he gets his coat. That was a surprise. Nobody had ever seen anything like this on camera. Immediately, if you're in the business, impossible. Carradine walks through for 900 extras. I'll turn my volume down in case it's getting in and making an echo. Hopefully you can hear it. And the wonderful thing about this is I went through this crowd like a ghost. And nobody looked at the camera because the camera and my face were in a different place. If they looked, they looked at my face. So this played at the so-called dailies or rushes two days later. I was very nervous and I had to wait for it for two hours of Haskell's wonderful shots. And at the end of that two hours, this shot came up and then there was silence. And then the entire crew, 150 people stood to their feet and clapped and yelled and called out Haskell's name. And my life just flipped at that moment. And it was the first of a hundred movies that I shot with the study team. And 
astonishing good luck that I would say that my first invention was a hit. The last shot on this impossible shots reel was this one. This is Ellen again, the art museum, running down the steps with that prototype with the fiber optic finder. And it's better than the big clumsy crane. It's, it rolls less, it's quite stable enough. And this was the shot that came to the attention of a man named John Abelson, who was preparing a movie called Rocky. Again, I don't know if uh, Rocky is known in India. Maybe, it's pretty popular around the world. You can see what I was really interested in by the nature of this shot, I'm embarrassed to say. <laughs> in any event, I quickly ended up on those same steps, which were then not distinctly not famous, shooting Rocky and chasing Sylvester Stallone, the lead actor and writer up the art museum steps. And then I ended up in the ring in Hollywood as they got to love this footage and then made it a bigger movie and so on. By the way, that look, we teach new study cam operators to have something called the look always on their face. A look of supreme contentment and happiness right up until the moment you fall down or die from exhaustion because directors do not like to look over and see the cameraman looking like he's suffering or she is suffering. This is not the look, this, this is the look, a look of supreme contentment while you're working as if it's not heavy and you feel no pain. This is on a film called Reds. Well, this stabilizer uh, demo got the attention of Stanley Kubrick. Um, I imagine you know Kubrick's films. Uh, this was, he was prepping one called The Shining and you'll notice at the end of this very complimentary um, telex that he sent us, which it was a miracle to me to read because I loved Kubrick. He said, is there a minimum height at which could you, can be used? He was already prepping The Shining, which you may know, his horror film. And I ended up working on that very quickly and shooting in what's called low mode, camera on the bottom and the rest of it on top, just to get the lens height down in the neighborhood for young Danny. And I ended up shooting in the Notorious Maze set. I was on The Shining for a year. It was a remarkable experience. This shot became famous, as did these. And you'll see how, how flexible the machine is in that kind of maze, you know, circumstance where you're weaving back and forth. Actually, this is the diagram of the maze set and we would constantly get lost in it and be fearful of a fire because that is salt the snow and styrofoam on the dried out bushes and thousand watt lights right next to them and of course if there was a fire in the maze i would not be here talking to you today because i don't think i would have gotten out alive This is uh, prepping for um, Return of the Jedi, the Star Wars movie called Return of the Jedi. I got to walk through the Redwood Forest and the camera was sped up 30 times. And that walking became the background plates for the optical put in for the speeder bikes in the famous speeder bike shot. Walking with a camera running less than one frame per second yields blurring, very realistic blurring on every frame. This is what an individual Vista Vision frame looked like as I walked at three quarter frames per second camera speed. Of course, walking very, very precisely. And this is, Indiana Jones and the Temple of, of Doom, so-called. And I was the only world camera in the world that could move on the rope bridge, which was a real rope bridge, built 300 feet above a, a stream in Sri Lanka. 
this is a relic, as you may be aware, you'll never see this again. No one will ever build a real rope bridge to shoot. It's way too easy to CGI, you know, computer graphics, these shots. And therefore the computer graphic artists will say, well, let's make it a thousand feet tall. There were big spaces between the boards. I don't know if you can see that here, possibly. No, not really. And our feet would have gone between the boards if we didn't keep our feet straight ahead. It was a pretty frightening set. Now it'll all be ones and zeros. How tall do you want it? You want two feet between the boards. And therefore it becomes somehow unrealistic very quickly. This is both a gift to movie going and a hazard because you know nothing much is real and it's way too easy to CGI everything. And what's missing sometimes is the actual verisimilitude we say of life, you know, in a fight, the dust cloud when somebody falls down, the ripple of flesh down their legs when they fall and so on. If I had more time, I could discuss that, but maybe we'll see at the end. So the study cam prototype is now in the possession of the new Academy Museum of uh, Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, which is not yet open in Hollywood, but they chased me to get the prototypes and they were turned over a year ago to them, which is sort of a relief to me that these objects are not in my care anymore. And even when I visit the museum, they have to put white gloves on me to touch my own prototypes. This is the building which they're making, which will be pretty astonishing. I think the virus has put a dent in these plans and it may not open in December, but if you're in Los Angeles and you're ever visiting there, come and uh, have a look at my little old prototype from 1973 which is there on display. And the study cam is, you know, has been now, now for 47 or eight years um, underway all around the world. We started teaching in 1980. I taught this gentleman in Rome, maybe 10 years after that. This is the most famous Italian operator. Um, and he is working for George Clooney and company here on a movie whose title I forget. But this is, if you think of my crane shot on Bound for Glory, this is what they're doing now with cranes. This is a gigantic shot. Get the name of the movie. He steps off, he moves. Here's the actual shot. Pretty astonishing. This is a bit of cheating, CGI cheating. This is actually an underwater camera, an actual shot on a little crane. This is our actual crane shot. Isn't this kind of a nostalgic site, pre-virus? All that lovely hanging out, and social non-distancing, isn't it wonderful? I imagine we'll get back to this world at some point, but it's pretty startling now to see how carefree we all were. You know. I suppose it's not bad that you all can tune in from wherever you are and see this lecture. And you can see the video very well and hear me and see me fairly well. But it is a change. The movie business is reopening in the US now. Um, and it's full of rules and 
casts and crews quarantining together and extreme care in how we behave with each other. And I imagine in Mumbai, which is I think the capital of movies in India, you will have to do the same thing. I don't know if you're open yet in Mumbai, but I wish you luck. And if you're interested in the movie business or in the movie business, it's going to be a very interesting journey from here. So now this is, um, this is something remarkable, which has happened in the US. These stairs, these steps to the art museum are now the number two tourist attraction in Philadelphia. They were totally not famous when Ellen and I ran up and down and they've become famous because of this film, Rocky. And people come from all over the world, all over the earth to run up the steps of the art museum because somehow it's become symbolic of achievement of <clears throat> facing problems. <clears throat> Summer and winter, they, they run up and down. It's amazing. Ah, this shot kills me. Now I want to uh, examine my list here and see where we are because I have something I'd love to talk to you about. Let's see if we can find it. Yeah. Let's talk movies for a second, all right, shall we? There are two broad kinds of shots. One is an objective shot, which is a director's eye view. In my mind, they ought to be smooth. These are study cam shots. This was my first day's work on The Shining, in fact. And an objective shot, I think, should not be obvious. Move with the actors, stop with the actors, change it up so it isn't boring. Let them breathe away from you and get closer to you. This shot is almost becoming Jack's point of view over his shoulder here. Stop with the actors. Move with the actors. Stop with the actors. If you're a study cam operator, then hold it still. They may use it as their master shot. This is a subjective shot, the eye view of a person or a creature. This happens to be from Terminator 2, one of my first favorite subjective eye view shots. Point of view, we say. Charmingly edited for the real shots and the point of views. If you're shooting a point of view, by the way, if you're a cinematography person, for heaven's sakes, don't shoot the walking don't shoot the lurching and up and downs of actual walking. I'll explain why. Notice there's no lurching. The shot is smooth as if it was a dolly shot. The Terminator, now then the governor of California, had a really ridiculous lurching walk. But it's not apparent in the point of view. I love these shots. They're very witty, very good. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> you forgot to, you say, forgot to say, say, please. I don't know if you have characters like this in India. An objective shot, a lovely shot, the opening to Pride and Prejudice, study cam, study cam over the shoulder, change it up, tripod shot. These extravagant shots set up open movies beautifully because they can introduce all the characters. 
Incidentally, I love this bit with the sheets and the walking semi-obscured and so on. Some beautiful work in this. This is a subjective shot. This is called that little switch is called a surprise. Those little swishes are what we do constantly when you look from one place to another. Go ahead, do it at home. Look from one side of your room to the other. I'll wait. What do you see actually when you do that? You sort of see everything in between, but it's blindingly fast. And look how well we operate our own eyeballs. We go boom, and they immediately land. We had to learn to do that with a study cam. It's called a swish pan. And this commercial was where that idea was originated. I'll play it again. Straight back, straight back. So we decided to try and duplicate the saccade on camera. This is a good subjective I got any strong neighbors? Want a beer? Want some help? Sure. This is great. Molson, make it go for me and my friends. Point of view is in the wrong direction. This is a shot of mine, actually, that I'm quite pleased with. This is from Casino. From the table to our boxes, through the cage, and into the most sacred room in the casino. He comes with the hand of all the money, over the, the holy of holies, the count room. Difficult set because these are non actors and they're in a different place for every case. I couldn't get inside. But it was my job to keep the filter cash. That's for sure. Pan. They had so much fucking money in there, you could fill the house up in a stack of $100 bills. And the best part was that upstairs, the board of directors didn't know what the fuck was going on. I mean, to them, everything looked on the up and up. Right? Wrong. The guys inside the county room a classic were all slipped in there to skin the joint dry. Study cam opportunities because you can do such slips, flamboyant stuff like right out of the drop boxes. And it was up to this guy right here, standing in front of about two million dollars, to skim the cash off the top without anybody getting wise, the IRS or anybody. Now notice how in the count room nobody ever seems to see anything. Somehow somebody's always looking the other way. Now look at these guys. They so look I had busy, to watch right? these guys to see what money. to shoot and Once keep an eye on their I mean, lead actor and get to him by the time he went out the door and so on and so on. Really fun. you're in and you're out. Pass the jag off guard who gets an extra C note a week just to watch the door. I mean, it's routine. Business as usual. In, out, hello, goodbye. We've played with the idea of this particular invention, what it's really for, and what it's really for, I think, is to make shooting look more like the way humans see things. We do not see things like this. This is a handheld shot. I'm the Jezebel. Notice the background shaking. Notice it's and you're the priests of unstable in the role. I see. This was what happened when you hold a camera and try to walk. So if you'll bear with me for a minute, I'll tell you why I feel this way so strongly. Human beings have an incredible stabilizer right built into our inner ear and eyeball combination. When we run, it's smooth. Why? Evolution. You know, if you ran and it looked like handheld, you would immediately be caught by what was chasing you or you would fail to catch your dinner, you know? So evolution equipped us with an inner ear that controls your eyeballs, believe it or not. So all at home, please do this with me. Please do it, okay? Do it. Look at something across the room and move your head up and down as violently as you can. Shake your head, go ahead. You, you, and you didn't do it. Come on, do it. Move your head and shake it. Now move it side to side and look at one thing across the room. It's pretty stable, right? The reason is the inner ear controls your eyeballs and makes them stay on the object. 
that you're looking at. Now, finally, tilt your head sideways. The room does not go off level, does it? Well, this is how we see our personal movie from birth. From the time we walk in our fully fledged human beings, our little stabilizer shows us the world like study cam shots. Um, study cam didn't get the credit until it was invented, but it is true. And therefore, uh, I think the fetish for handheld shooting is lazy and expedient, but maybe not the best way to shoot. Um, directors will say, all right, in a, in a fight or a frightening action shot, it should be handheld because it looks more exciting. Here's one. This is from Children of Men, a famous... I'm sorry. To me, that does not work. It just looks handheld. You know? It looks like a newsreel cameraman is running right with them. And it, the giveaway is it's shaky in the Rolex. And as we just showed, humans don't see that. So the ideal, I think, would have been a lightweight, rough study cam that was violent. Uh, but resembled the way humans see. If you were ever attacked, God forbid you were ever mugged, as we say, attacked on the street and punched and thrown down and so on, you don't see like handheld. You see like your human mechanism trying to get a grip on something. And you would see the odds still in between blurring while you were being pummeled by someone. Totally different than this. So. I've been looking for a scene in the movies that is like this idea, because I think this is how action should be shot. And here's one, this is pretty close from Titanic. Uh, and the camera operator, Jimmy Muro, had a very small study cam made and a super light 35 millimeter camera. And he did rough study cam, but it more resembles the human eye. To wait for it. What are you doing? There. No. Stay sort of level. It jerks around like you would be jerking if you were running. This is good. But it's not handheld. It's more exciting than that. So well, here it slows so down. Why'd you do that, huh? You're so stupid, Rose. You're so stupid, Rose. Why did you do that? Why? You jump high, jump right. Oh, God. Uh oh. Nice little Dutch angle here. Please, I'm with you. This stunt doesn't really work. Watch this. Not bad here. Oh, stunt double. <laughs> Etc. So this is a bit odd. I can't see you. You can see me, but I cannot see you. I can't tell whether you actually moved your head when I asked you to. I can't tell whether you're nodding and going, yeah, Sam, he has a point that that could be good for shooting action or whether you're going, mm, I like handheld, I don't know. But if you can someday, give that a try and try to, try to stabilize your images when you move, if you can, if you're making movies. This, by the way, is from Raiders of the Lost Ark. And here's this fight scene that I told you about. Before CGI, did you see that? This is the reality that a real shot like that actually gives, the dust, the, the flesh. Let's see that again. Oh, 
Right, that wasn't good. Oops. That was good. That's tough to do with CGI. By contrast. Totally unreal. She just pulled 20 G's, that old lady. She'd be dead. Or this. This is from Peter Jackson's King Kong. Poor Fay Ray. Look at that. Oh, she'd be dead. 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 She'd be dead. Oh, she's still alive. <laughs> That's the problem with CGI in a nutshell. Uh, just the difficulty of of making it really real when you have to plug in ones and zeros for every dust mote and every detail. And you also have to remember Newtonian physics. Watch this. Here is King Kong, who's supposed to weigh six or eight tons, running around like a chimpanzee that weighed 500 pounds. Look at him. Moving like something that weighs as much as a No. They totally got it wrong. He's running like a couple hundred pounds thing. Well, I'll say no more about that. That approaches the end of my little discussion with you all. I hope uh, I hope that you will think about inventing. If you haven't already invented something, I hope that if you're in the movie business, you'll think a little bit about the nature of your moving shots. Uh, and maybe you'll even get to combine those passions and invent something for the movies. I can assure you that is the absolutely most fun thing that you could do is invent a, an advance for the movie business. Uh, Ellen and I, all these years later, have friends all around the world who are study cam operators. We can almost go to any city on the planet and someone will buy us a dinner. Uh, and I get to do my little talks all over the place at film festivals and, and so on. Um, and we've just, had, we've just had the grandest time with this. And it all stemmed from that stupid... 400 kilogram dolly and and hating what it meant for my days in the movies and you know lifting it onto trucks and so on and it stemmed from imagining that there must be a way to disconnect camera and camera person lo these almost 50 years ago so here we are and now with great joy i will turn it back over to my hosts and uh, Kagi, if you're going to be in charge again, let's see you. And let's start to take some questions from your crowd if you're ready for that. I'm just going to sit here and wait until that happens. I'm going to stop sharing. Yes. Boom. There you are. It was really an impactful session. We all enjoyed the movie clips that you showed and the effects were really amazing. I'll could you hear? Could you hear the soundtrack to my, to my movie clips? Okay. Uh, due to some copyright issues, we were not able to do that, but we have a recording of this session, so we'll post it later on our Instagram account. Okay. <clears throat> so, I have uh, the first question is: So, do you believe that the externals of camera manipulation is way more important than the internal particulars? How do you think it will change the course of cinematography in the future? Are you asking if the study cam, about the study cam in particular, or about the art of camera operating? The Which one? Art of the op uh, operating of cameras. Of, of operating cameras. Okay, that's a wonderful question because I happen to believe that operating is one of the seminal movie skills. The way you take the audience's eyeball 
essentially in your hands, whether you're on a tripod or a crane or with a study cam, you control the nature of what they see. And there is, an, a, there is a series of attributes that a moving shot supplies. It could be kinetic and therefore exciting. Uh, it could be uh, emotional because it reveals something. It has a storytelling arc when it comes around a corner and you first see something, you know, that has to do with the nature of the operator's control. And even the move itself, you know, is, is conditioned by the emotional content of the move. This move, for example, <laughs> has a almost exclamation point quality, whereas this move is different. You know, I should have actually just moved the camera itself. You know, I should have done this. Now I've unplugged myself, so I have to go back. But I love that stuff. I love what happens with a well-operated camera. It is a great job. And this is a commercial, so I apologize. But study cam operating is by far the best job in the movies, by far. It's athletic and it's artistic, you know? And moving a camera in the old way on a tripod or a dolly means panning and tilting, which is very limiting. Moving the camera when you control its position in the universe means that moves acquire a combined quality of not only your angle, but you know, but where the you know where the camera is in space, you know, a combination of the of what can turn out to be a French curve of a dolly move that on screen puts that lens just where you want it, you know. So that's a brilliant question, and I, I am happy it was answered. I should have said that in the talk, but operating is right up there with, in my view, with acting, directing, you know, et cetera. Of course, I would think that because I'm an operator, but there you are. No, sir, but that's absolutely, uh, absolutely true. Like, we wouldn't have such amazing scenes from Indiana uh, Jones and many other movies. So, like, even cinematography is of that importance such as of acting. Now the next question is, what are the new technology effects which have entered in the film industry? Say that again, uh, yes, and say it very clearly because you broke up. What are the new technology effects which have entered the industry like in the past decade? What effect does technology have on the total industry? And what was the end of the question? Uh, yeah, I'll repeat. What are the new technology effects which have entered the film industry? Yes. It is, uh, it is odd because it is so now so technological. The images are so clear. The sound is so incredible, surround sound. Uh, our means of moving the camera are so extremely interesting. Um, but I'm a believer that the essence of the movies is the same as it was when that first Edison film, The Sneeze, made people laugh, or when that first film of a train coming made people scream and run out of the theater. The essence of it uh, is not the special effects, it is the human story content. And so in my view, all the rest of it, all the technology should properly be aimed at making the story work. Uh, if I can find it, there's a wonderful example. Can I have the screen back? I'll just, I'll try to show something interesting. Maya, you have plenty of time, correct? Yes, you can't can. hear you. Okay. Uh, give me screen sharing again. Let me know when. Hmm, well, where is it? Hold on.
is a sample of technology driving us crazy. Well, no, alas, I must say, I don't have that shot with me. Um, so I can't show you that. So I will stop sharing again. Back to you. Um, but I'll describe it. I will describe it. It's a shot you may know. It's the one of the final shots in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. Is that film familiar to people in India? Yes. Okay. And the shot, they are, they are uh, climbing a mountain. Gandalf, I think is his name, and, and uh, the hobbits are climbing through the snow. And here comes a swarm of black birds, CGI yeah. birds. And those birds sweep down into the forge of Charon or some such thing. And we follow the birds down into the bowels of the earth. And it goes on and on and on and on. And you see people working in the forges and people hammering, you know, and it's a spectacular shot. And they worked three months on it because it was the early days of CGI. And the shot then has a cheat in it, and it moves sweeping down and it moves past a pillar to get them into a live shot of, I think, Christopher Lee, you know, in his, in his robes. And he turns to the camera and he says, and there you will be on such and such, and that is the thing that will happen to you. you know? And suddenly we've been bored by the bird shot long ago. I mean, it just, you know, it was just, just an extravaganza. As soon as that live human, appears and he says using the ancient craft of storytelling and acting then where will you be we're riveted riveted by it you know so that tells you that the technology is good and proper and and fun and it has to evolve and there's a segment of our audience that you know loves fast and furious 9 and fast and furious 12 and fast and furious 27 you know, because they like the accumulation of effects and so on. But there's another great, enormous part of our audience that is touched by the human quality of great acting, you know, or singing or, or anything. And that applies to Bollywood films and it applies to Hollywood films. It's, it's universal and that I love. And the fact that my little invention can disappear it can disappear into a good objective shot, for example, or a good subjective shot. And what's left is what we look at. And all I'm doing is giving you a better look, a more intimate look. I'm putting you into not only the physical reality, but the emotional reality of the shot. That's the thrilling part, you know. We used yeah. to joke that, I'll, I'll tell this joke, we used to joke trying to describe study cam operating. It's a combination of great effort at times and then very delicate artistic action, right? Panning and tilting. And I use the example, it's like moving a piano and playing it at the same time. <laughs> anyway, that's a good question. Let's have another. Yes. Um, this one is a good one. So you have said that steady I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll be the judge of whether it's a good one. Uh, yeah. Okay. You Go have ahead. said that steady cam by itself doesn't do a thing. It barely allows a gifted human being to do this amazing trick. So what do you think contributes to the ideal gifted steady cam operators? Well, first of all, that's very true. And it is true that I said that. Um, Almost the best thing about the study cam is that it's not a machine with a black box with buttons and you press a button and it's stable because there are innumerable gimbals that do that. They're stupidly stable, but they're not very good for operating. You, you know, you pan one and it pans later, you know. Uh, the study cam as an instrument means that you're abilities as a player 
become the important thing. And that's what makes it satisfying to do. Um, so I think that that makes learning to be a good operator difficult but it makes being a good study cam operator more satisfying. And you do not have to be big, strong person to do it. Some of the very best operators are small women. Women get it much faster than men in our classes. And we puzzle over that because these big brutes come in and think they will do it. And they end up sweating and hurting and so on. A woman picks it up and understands immediately that it's about balance just as if she was nine months pregnant. It's about how you stand, you know, it's about, and women just get it right away. And these big brutes look at them like, you know, they can't imagine how that, how that really happened, you know? Um, so yes, uh, that is a true statement. And to me, it is the best thing about it. Yes. Um, can I, yeah, the next question is, uh, what were some of the most challenging shots to get throughout your career? Say again, sorry, yes. breaking up a little. What were- Say it slowly, very clearly and loudly, go. What were some of the most challenging shots to get throughout your career? Uh, that I did or that other people did? No, that Me? you did. That I did, ah. I, it's like asking a violin player, what was the favorite performance that they made? Um, there may be some, I have shots that I, I still like, some of them which are, they're very hard to even explain. Uh, I'm not a fan of enormous long, we say oneers, shots that are uncut, which study cam can do really well. And sometimes they're marvelous, you know, the, most absurdly wonderful one was a film called Russian Ark that was an hour and a half uncut study cam shot walking through the Hermit Hermitage as a almost fictional artistic shot. And I normally wouldn't say that my uncut shots were my favorites because sometimes fast moves with cuts are, are wonderful study cam shots. So number one, the exercising of this art with the instrument is satisfying no matter what it is. You know, a, a shot where you're standing still looking at somebody talking, you know, and the camera, which is very difficult to do, starts to do this while they're talking, you know, is first of all, mechanically wonderful to execute and extremely satisfying because you'll notice the background doesn't change size, the foreground is changing size and it's emphasizing the human qualities of the speech. I'm hand holding my computer, so it's not looking that great, but for me, my favorite shot and my favorite job ever was in the year 2000 in Paris. I shot an opera, La Traviata, film style, live, but film style from four locations with uh, the great Vittorio Storaro as the DP and Zubin Mehta conducting and a wonderful operatic director, Patroni Griffey and a fabulous Siberian soprano named Iteri Gvadseva and uh, a marvelous Spanish tenor. And so we rehearsed for three months in Paris, living in the fifth arrondissement and I would bicycle to work every day and rehearse, 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 because as, as it was shot film style, it meant that it needed to look like a movie and yet it actually had to be live. There had to be a conductor and the singers had to see the conductor. So there were monitors hidden in the scenery in, this, in these sets. And there were people crawling along under the, under the camera to uncover a monitor at the right time and then crawling back and then covering it again because your shot was looking there. And there were mirrored doors that had pencil lines on the floor. And there would be people crawling in and opening the door to pencil line number three so that I wouldn't see two reflections and there's the other study cam operator, you know? And to accomplish that, because I never shot live before, was like a combination of my best movie work and the tension of having one take and having to get it right. And it was wonderful lighting and 
you know, Vittorio's flags would swing and open and lights would come on and off with dimmers and so on. Just before the final performance, which was an uncut 23 minute shot of mine, following an uncut three minute setup by my colleague, another great study cam operator, Valentin Monge, French. And incidentally, this production was Italian and French, you know, with queuing cues being given in four languages by in our headsets and so on. <laughs> I would have this poor woman who had to queue in four languages in my headset say, remind yourself of the vase. Because I told her to remind me not to back in and topple a vase on a, you know, on a bench and stuff. But um, in the middle of this shot, the last shot was in the apartment. If you've ever seen La Traviata, Violetta is dying and Alfredo is coming back into her life, but too late to save her. And she eventually dies against the glass of a window and so on. But just before that, the high point emotionally of 23 minutes of me moving just with them, being invisible, being in exactly the right place in terrible intimacy with them as they're singing and she's dying and so on. Vittorio had asked us to do a run through with stand-ins just before the final shot. And evidently a stand-in stepped on a barn door and obscured the, the ultimate key light for, for her at the most important moment as she's singing just before she dies. And none of us knew it. And that's the hazard with stand-ins. I know we had begged him, don't use stand-ins. So I get to that point in the shot and Violetta is in the dark. She's dark. And just as I'm about to try and, you know, look around because you can hold a study cam shot and be looking to see what's happening. I, I might have been able to open the door with my foot while holding that shot. I see beneath me Vittorio Storaro, the famous guy with his white scarf around his neck, crawling like a, a Marine across the floor, looking up at me and smiling. And he goes like this, wait. And he had a glove on and he waits for a musical highlight. And he opened up the barn door and lit her up in that highlight. And then he scuttles away and through an invisible door just before I pan with her that would have shown him the door. And I had tears of both laughter and joy coming down my face. And at the end of that shot, when she dies with Notre Dame lit up in the background, Vittorio had lit the entire casino. She died at midnight, actual midnight, in this apartment on the Ile Saint Louis. And it, and it fades to black. And the crew piled into the room and piled out on the key, roaring and laughing and yelling. And, you know, all of us were covered with sweat and the director and Vittorio, they were yelling his name. Boy, you don't get a moment like that, you know, in a lifetime, unless you're very lucky. So you're right, that was a marvelous question. And, and I have these kinds of memories from, you know, a hundred films and that's the best one. Yeah, it's amazing to have so much experience and I'm sure that when I'm speaking this, I'm speaking on uh, behalf of the entire audience that is watching you right now, that you have positively revealed groundbreaking thoughts and promising ideas while instilling a new perspective in each one of our lives. And so we are honored by your presence. It was indeed an impactful session. And also thank you to the wonderful audience for tuning in. We hope you all enjoyed the session. I am Gargi Subhand, and until next time, this is Technovanza BJTI. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. That was good and fun. Yes, it was. Uh, I'll just check whether the live stream has stopped or not. Yeah, it's done. It was really amazing. <laughs>